Tonight's program is the latest in the Jean and John Rowe series, My America, Immigrant and Refugee Writers Today, held in conjunction with the exhibit of the same name that can be seen at my-america.org. From Germany to Peru to California, historian and anthropologist Claudio Lumnitz turns a scholar's eye to the story of his own family's history. Nuestra America traces the intersections of Latin American and Jewish culture through World War II, the Holocaust and exile, leftist politics and early Zionism. His linguist study of the way in which parents and children tell stories about the past to inform the present makes for a narrative that poet Arcadio Diaz Quinonez called brilliant and beautifully written. Claudio and Arcadio join us now for a conversation about the book. Well, thank you all for, for, for joining us tonight. And thank you, uh, Arcadio, so much for, uh, for doing this, uh, this conversation. Oh, thank you. It's really a pleasure. I'm so happy to, to be able to celebrate uh, you and your wonderful book on Nuestra America and to share uh, some thoughts about it uh, here with uh, tonight uh, and, and, and with the audience. Uh, and, um, you know, it's a book that I have uh, admired in Spanish and even uh, more now in English. It's a book uh, written twice, as you say in the book, in Spanish first and then in English. Uh, history and family, family history, biography, but also autobiography. I think it's, uh, for me, very important uh, how a Jewish community took shape in exile, a story of exiles and diasporas. I think it's a very moving, learned book, uh, which, uh, because you have a superb eye for the, I would say for the human condition to, to, to use the Hannah Arendt title, uh, and an, uh, an incredible talent for storytelling. The stories of uh, women and men uh, showing both their, their strength, but also their vulnerability. I think that's what, uh, what I find here in this book. I wanted to, to show the, the, the book, the beautiful cover of the book uh, and the photo too. So I think that indicates biography and autobiography. Uh, childhood is an important topic and the relationship of the child uh, with, the, with the elders in the family. For me, you know, the, the most important question or one of the most important questions here in this book is uh, what does it really mean to belong? What does it mean to belong? And actually uh, not one, but multiple belongings. Uh, belonging to the family, belonging to a Latin American community, a national community, what does it mean to be at the same time mm -hmm. a member of a Jewish community and Mexican? Mm -hmm. What does it mean when you cross borders, new borders? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the linguistic complexity of crossing borders. That's all in this book, very rich uh, book. Uh, and then also I find that uh, uh, you're telling stories, but also making links where no one else has made links before. I think that's what the way I read the book, that you're telling stories and making important links. In this case, very prominently to, to Latin America, uh, the case of, uh, of uh, your grandfather and it's part of intellectual history, a very important intellectual history uh, the relationship with uh, Mariategui in Peru and a whole political movement and a political moment and the repression of that movement at the same time too. Uh, the idea that diaspora is uh, different, complex, that, that the gains and losses too, uh, that comes very prominently in the book, all the gains, but also the losses together. That's why I say the human condition, you know, that Hannah Arendt thought about displacement, violence. So I wanted to, to ask you, uh, maybe 
maybe about this subtle exploration of belonging that I find in the book. Belonging to the family, belonging to the nation, belonging to a broader, larger community. If that, for you, it has been an important, um, important issue and topic in narrating this story. Maybe I can start with that question. <laughs> Thanks. I mean, yeah, uh, that, 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 that's a big question because and to some extent it's something that, uh, that uh, I discovered and was developing in the course of the writing of the book. And it's part of the transformative effect of writing uh, is in connection to belonging. I, in part, I think it's reflected in the title itself because Nuestra America, at first I was, I, 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 at some point I started thinking that that had to be the title of this book. Um, and um, my- Tell us more <laughs> about that title, yes. And, uh, you know, and, and uh, 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 when I started, when I kind of, you know, uh, the 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 title came out that came in that image and I then I, I just was unable to shake it I tried other titles mm -hmm. and that's the title that that just was uh, kind of gra uh, <laughs> grafted onto my mind and in part it's interesting because I think it has to do with your question of belonging because in part I, in my I think that the initial image came to me in an intimist kind of way Nuestra America or America like my family's America, or a, a very, a, 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 a kind of marginal, um, a marginal take on, on America, right? A, 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 in a minor key, as opposed to, let's say, a Nuestra America in the, you know, in the, in the, in the major key of the oh, Marti tradition or whatever of, yes. of thinking of, Spanish America or Ibero America, as opposed to Anglo America, this one was more modest. It, it, it would like more, well, my family's take, that's how it started. But I have to say that the more I thought about it and the more I worked with it, the more I thought that this belonging, uh, that this, uh, this holding on to this America was first of all, a necessary act. Yes. And not so optional as I had, as I had imagined it when I, mm -hmm. you know, for myself, when I was thinking about my grandparents, less optional, more, more a necessity, more a commitment. And it, it uh, resonated in the end with this, what I, what I thought of as a kind of Zapatista approach yeah. to belonging, which is, mm -hmm. you know, that uh, the Zapatista, which comes from the Flores Magón tradition, from yes. the Alex tradition in, in, well, in Spain, but in Mexico, uh, a, of the land belongs to those who work it. Yeah. I mean, to, to at a certain point, I thought, well, you know, the the land belongs to those who work it, and the belonging is, is something that is connected to to certain kind of work. Mm -hmm. And that was in, in, at the moment that that became clear to me, my story started seeming a little bit less marginal than I had imagined. Mm -hmm. And some, and in some way, I now think that. This story, which is a story in part of the destruction of Europe and mm -hmm. and what that meant for South America and right. for, uh, and what that meant for me and but uh, I, I I now think that the destruction of Europe in the 20th century could be thought of almost as a fourth route for Latin mm. American culture. That's uh, very interesting. Yes, as a, you know, so we have the traditional European indigenous and. Uh, African roots of Latin because of the role of exiles and diaspora and, and and new beginnings and new forms of belonging because of that too is so, so important in various countries. No, uh, yeah, I think so. I think it's it's true all over, and that there is some characteristics uh, that this Jewish history I think uh, is is a, is a big part of, but it's not exclusively a Jewish thing. Right. I don't think. Mm. Yeah. It has to do in part, I, th I think it has to do in part with a kind of universalism. Yes. Uh, that that became a necessity in the face of the destruction of Europe if you were an anti-fascist. Right. Um, a, maybe, maybe uh, I'm sorry, just to interrupt a little, maybe uh, I would like to hear from you more about your, your grandfather and Peru and Mariategui because that's also 
Nuestra América. I mean, he's a protagonist. Mm -hmm. uh, he is an important character, one of the important characters in the narrative. Uh, could you could you tell us more about him and and the importance and how you were discovering and rediscovering because this is a book about discovery too, discovery and rediscovering, right? That's an, that's interesting, uh, and particularly with him and others, you were discovering that history. No? Yes, it's true because my my grandfather died when I was 13 and I was very close to him. I, I loved him and um, I always had him, uh, you know, present at some level, but, um, but at the same time, there's, <clears throat> there's so much that I didn't either didn't know or didn't understand or rethought um, or dis or discovered, as you said, in, in writing and working on this book. Uh, he was born uh, In, in, in 1905 in, in a town called Nova Sulitza, which was a little bit like a Macondo in my family. This Nova yeah. Sulitza was a, it's, and that, that probably is some testament, testament to my grandfather's storytelling because uh, I don't have a, a, a similar image of a town for any other of my grandparents. Um, but this Nova Sulitza was a little bit of a Macondo. It was, it, 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 it was a sort of, Uh, originary town kind of a, a, a story mm. and it was a town that was a border I, I discovered writing the book I never understood this uh, until I started working on this uh, it's that, one of your that, discoveries one of your many discoveries here right mm -hmm. one of my discoveries is is that my grandfather came from a border town yeah, right, right. <laughs> yeah. and, and that, that the town that he was born on was literally crossed by the border between the Russian and the Austro-Hungarian Empire Uh, and uh, his family came from the Austro-Hungarian side, but settled on the Russian side. And uh, and so it's a border story from the start. And that that also, that kind of um, schism, fracture, and multiplicity of languages that comes along with that is, I think, part of the, part of the yeah. story and part of what's relevant about this moment that you're talking about his arrival to Peru in the 1920s and his and, and my grandmother, they met in Lima, is friendship with Mariati, which became a mystery to me um, because Mariati, for, for those of you who, who don't know South America or South American history was really a major uh, uh, Marxist thinker and one of the great uh, modern vanguardist thinkers of, uh, I think in general and certainly yes. in America. Yeah. And um, I had always inherited this as a kind of badge of honor that my grandparents were, you know, so close to Mariati and such close friends. But when I started reading the book, uh, the friendship became more mysterious to me. Like, why? Mm. Well, what was in it for him, for Mariati? Right. <laughs> uh, because uh, Mariati, he was already a great, and although he was very young, uh, he was already really a great personage. And my grandparents were starting, they were not as uh, nowhere near, I think, um, you know, of that, of the kind of uh, uh, consequence that, that uh, the Mariati already had in the, in the 20s. And uh, so, and I think that part of the proximity, I discovered that part of the proximity did come exactly from this sort of universalism. Right. Exactly from language, uh, from, uh, from, um, kind of a Goethe sort of idea of world literature, I think. An openness, uh, an openness uh, to, to diversity and intellectual traditions and, and to the world, no? That, that's, uh, yes, that's uh, interesting at the same time because that's, he's a protagonist. I wanted to ask you too about some of the women who are in the book mm -hmm. uh, because it's uh, belonging seems to be different in some cases there. Some of them are intellectuals, some of them are writers, some of them are noted in the book because they remain silent mm -hmm. uh, about some of the chapters of the family history. Could you tell us a bit about that too, the women in yeah. your narrative? <clears throat> Can you talk a second uh, about my, my paternal grandmother because that was also to me a, a big... Uh, change that that happened in me in the process of researching and writing the book my my father was born in cologne my father's family german jews and they emigrated to santiago which was where i was born 
in Chile in, <clears throat> in 1938. And um, um, my grandmother was, a, was an opera singer and um, with a frustrated career um, because of the exile, but not only because of the exile, turned out that uh, really uh, Nazism and uh, yeah. And the rise of, uh, of, of the Nazis in, in Germany had a, a key part in, in terminating her career. But um, there's a whole story that was uncovered in this book, which is the assassination of her father, of my great grandfather, my yeah. father's grandfather, uh, which I had never heard about. That is, my father never told me the story. Um, after my father's death, just a few years ago, he did leave um, a notebook of some memories in, in which he mentions um, that his grandfather was killed, but he was never told why uh, or by whom. He, rather, he was misled to think uh, that the grandfather had been killed by an, a disgruntled employee. His, this, this man, his name was... It's Sina. a way of silence in the story, right? And it's a silence of the story because he was actually it was actually a hate crime. It was done by this Freikorps that is the mm -hmm. early, the very first months actually of the rise of the Nazi Party. Um, and uh, <clears throat> and uh, my grandmother uh, named her son this gave her son the same name as her father. Her son, my father, was born two or three years after this assassination, but in a Latinate way so it was not as Jewish sounding so uh, Sina C-I-N-N-A uh, yeah. that name yes yes. yes and and hid this whole story and as a uh, um, you know in some way um, the question of protection of inter intergenerational protection and the role of some of the women in my family in intergenerational protection, which included in her case, really hiding, sitting on a, a very fundamental truth, which is the murder of her father. Mm, well. um, just uh, led me to, 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 to look at her and to find out more about her than, than, than I had as she, you know, I, she, I didn't know her pretty well. She died when I was <clears throat> in my early twenties and, uh, and to discover um, in her case, she had affected onto German sort of high culture because she had been born in Poland. They had emigrated from Galicia to, uh, to uh, Mannheim in Germany when she was maybe nine or 10. And she became uh, a lover of German culture. And so uh, of German, of opera, of singing, but also of literature. And then the Nazis kill her father, her mm -hmm. career is, as a singer is basically terminated. And then they, they emigrate to, to first to Belgium and then to Chile. Um, so I think that this strong connection on her part to a, one, one high culture, which was German high culture, and then being um, sort of kicked out of that Yes, um, is something that I still don't totally, I still haven't totally calibrated how, my, yes. how that affects me, how that affected my father, how that might affect me. There is, I think, some depth of... Uh, so you're attempting to sort out that past in the book too. That's, it makes mm -hmm. it very powerful mm -hmm. to make sense of the world of your parents and grandparents and their traumas too. Mm -hmm. that, that doesn't stop. I mean, it, it goes on and on. No? Yeah. Uh, and it's very, I mean, in that sense, it's a book that, that speaks, I think, very deeply to all of us in these dark times. You know? So many refugees and so many displaced persons and, and the traumas and the losses. And, and uh, what are they going? to retain uh, for the children and grandchildren what they choose to remain, uh, to, to hide or to remain silent about. That's, it, it speaks very powerfully uh, to our times too. Uh, uh, I, I see that in the book. 
I feel that in the book, you know, yeah. treatment of, that's why I was referring to gains and losses in this uh, process. Some of them are very, very deep personal traumas and, and, and you're trying to make sense of the family as well, how well they were able to survive. That's how I read it too. Uh, yes. <clears throat> and also, well, yeah, yeah, no, I wanted to ask you about uh, also something related because in your previous or one in one of your previous books, a book that I uh, admire enormously the, because it goes back to the national question on, on the Flores Magon and, and the book, uh, that book is also a book about crossing borders. And it's also a book about repression. And it's also a book about, uh, I think, uh, strength and vulnerability. No? It's an important chapter of the Mexican, of Mexican and American history too. And you are a historian and you are an anthropologist. My question is, what is the relation, how do you see the relationship between that previous book on Flores Magón and Nuestra America? Because I see many of the same issues there, no? Mm -hmm. The nation, borders, languages. And you are a Mexican scholar and intellectual, and you are also have been in the United States for a long time now. You are an American academic in many ways. And mm -hmm. uh, you are at least bilingual in English and Spanish, what you write. Mm -hmm. And all those topics are in your previous book as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Who gets to write the story? And what is the role of uh, the writer uh, who can step in and can step out or can go in, can go across the border linguistically and culturally? What does it say about you too? That's, um, that's my question. <laughs> Um, well, I, I I do think that it's it's astute of you to 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 pick up this connection with the with the return of comrade Ricardo Flores Magón with this book that I wrote about the Mexican anarchists and their American socialist uh, friends. Again. It's really a wonderful book, American uh, socialist and Mexican, uh, you know, radicals. It's a frontier book. It's a wonderful book. It's a frontier book, and I think that it was the, the writing of that book is what made um, this book possible because um, I actually had, I had uh, maybe 20 years ago uh, thought of writing something about my family. I taped interviews with my mother and with my uncles, um, uh, you know, a number as a, as a kind of anthropologist. I, I, did, uh, I did a number of, of close interviews. I tried to and then uh, once I had all that, I, I, I didn't have a book. I mean, there's, I, I didn't even start writing it. I, what I thought was, okay, well, I, maybe I don't have anything to say about this. At least I'll preserve this, this documents. But, um, but, uh, but I couldn't really think about how to write them, how to write this. And I, I think that the, the Flores Magón book made it possible to a large degree because that, that's a book about the Mexican Revolution uh, that takes an eccentric viewpoint with regard to the Mexican right. Revolution. The Mexican Revolution has always been told, at least in Mexico, uh, as a national saga. Uh, right. And uh, this book tells the Mexican Revolution um, as, a, as a transnational saga, as something that actually emerged um, to a very large degree outside of Mexico. Um, and not it's also a book that goes then against uh, a narrow version of America as yes. it's used in this country, no? Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Because, uh, absolutely, because uh, the, first of all, the, the Mexican Revolution is co-produced in fr a set of friendships between right. Americans and Mexicans. Mm -hmm. and, it's, it, and also in, in, from the US point of view, with interesting identifications with things to do with happening in Mexico. Like for example, in the case of uh, the Mexican revolution, Americans concerned with slavery and slavery in Mexico right. bondage, uh, or uh, the, tale, veil, uh, the trail of tears, the, the genocide of the native peoples of the US, then 
being transposed onto Mexican politics and creating a, a new mentality that was neither American, US American or Mexican, but yeah. something new. And I think that this is what's, what, I, once, I, once I saw that, I was, I think, able to, um, to write up this book because this book is neither uh, Jewish history uh, nor South American history as if those right. two things were separate. What this book does is show I think it does it, uh, through, in a very personal way and not in an academic way, but still um, what I think it does show is that, uh, South American cultural history and the Jewish history that I know and understand uh, in some way made each other. And uh, that's, it's not, uh, and that was not something that I, uh, that I could visualize or envision before looking at this movement, this radical, movement that, that happened on the border in the early 20th century. A very transformative movement and for the uh, full of, uh, of violence and tragedy and, and death and prison and, mm -hmm. and uh, but also uh, in that book as in this one you raise the question of uh, the nationalist uh, discourse and how nations appropriate uh, how, how even heroes become national after, mm -hmm. uh, after the state has uh, institutionalized its views, that's that's very interesting and and very important uh, today. You know, I think. Uh, and it's there's some kind of killing that happens in that national appropriation, in my view. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there's yes. it's almost like a second, a second uh, killing. Yes, right. Because oh. and you see it too in the way that I read, uh, for example, Mariategui, the the this. Yes. this such important figure in 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 Nuestra America in this book. Um, well, I, I read Mariati in college, like many people do when they go to college and and do read social sciences or intellectual history of Latin America. And I had tended to read him in a somewhat, first of all, strongly in the Latin Americanist and also somewhat nationalist vein, um, which I think was completely mistaken, and it's a misreading of Mariate. Right, that's yeah, it's very illuminating in that sense. Yes, mm -hmm. what, what you have done and yeah, you've been thinking. Uh, I wanted to ask you to, uh, uh, to to pursue even further that question about belonging in your own. Um, you're an academic uh, in the United States, but you also are a Mexican, very active in Mexican intellectual life. Uh, you published there. You you have just been elected to the Colegio Nacional uh, in Mexico. So you have managed to be in both places. You're a historian, anthropologist. You have written uh, incredibly uh, important books about Mexico and, and uh, that we all treasure. So uh, how uh, and in in the end at the end of this book, a sense of an ending in this beautiful book. Our America, uh, the, the last chapter is devoted to you. No, it's uh, it, it's in the first person, uh, singular, and you write. Uh, you you know you you tell us you tell the reader uh, how you worked on this. It's about uh, the childhood as as a collective achievement, with beautiful pages too devoted to your your reflection about yourself too. Uh, that's when the book. Uh, becomes explicitly autobiographical as well. No, uh, it's it's biographical and autobiographical because these lives are linked. And I thought about uh, Walter Benjamin because Benjamin has a beautiful text that I uh, always refer to: excavation and memory. And and uh, and he writes that it's like a parable, and he says excavation. Memory is not an instrument, it's a medium. And when we start digging, um, we go back, even dig more in the soil that has been so nourishing us. No? And, and it seems to me that, that in a way, that's what you've been doing uh, in this book too. You go back, you're digging into memories. But Benjamin suggests also that in the process of digging, one is transformed. The person, the man or the woman who is doing the digging 
is transformed. And I wanted to ask you about that. It's a beautiful, uh, in, <clears throat> it's a beautiful image and, uh, and I think very true. Um, uh, <clears throat> to me, um, memory is, uh, as you say, digging into memory. Um, in, in this case, is also in dialogue with writing, right? Mm -hmm. And so there's there's a there's a movement between the just the creation in in the writing and uh, the coming back and back and back into various memories, right? And the, mm -hmm. the process of going back in and out of them is, I think, to some extent, um, at least in my case, mediated by either questions to do with um, logic almost, things that I don't understand. Um, sometimes I don't understand them because I don't. I realize that I don't even understand the chronology, how mm -hmm. this came before that. Did mm -hmm. this come before that? Uh, so sometimes that, that digging, it, it takes almost an archeological uh, dimension mm -hmm. because you're not sure what, uh, if there's a there's a temporal order that is confused in the memory, right. um, and then some of it is is uh, some of it is happening in dialogue with really historical uh, sources that is not memory that is um, pr primary documents uh, that sit uneasily with with the memories, sometimes they sit uneasily because I don't have the memory right. that corresponds to, to a, a fact or, um, or sometimes the fact prompts a memory. Uh, but in that whole dialogue and the, the construction of stories, um, in, I, do, I do feel that, the, that there's a way in which uh, Sort of the book, uh, the book wrote, wrote me. <laughs> Not only I wrote. Right. I <laughs> There's there is something like that happening. Um, even as you said, I mean, this book was written twice. I wrote it first in Spanish and then I rewrote it in English. Mm. And even the rewriting in English, uh, the second writing, was deeply transformative. This book is actually very, you know, quite different in English than very English. different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, and. Uh, and so I'm not sure how exactly I would characterize the transformative side of it. I think one of it is to do with um, what you said earlier about recognizing, um, uh, uh, bringing these pasts into a present that in, to some degree needs them, um, mm -hmm. needs that past or can really use that, those experiences because of what you, I think, rightly called our dark times. Mm -hmm. um, so the story has a, it has a resonance with our contemporary situation that is both intimate and, um, and general and let's say historical. Um, that's one thing, but uh, another I think is that um, you sit, you sit for a long time with these characters and these moments and uh, the books that they were reading or the, um, the, the situations that they faced. And in that process, um, in, <clears throat> on the one hand, what matters at least to me become clearer, became clearer. And on the other, I think that um, I became a little bit less harsh than, than I was, <laughs> you know? It had, yeah. had a slightly, I mean, in terms of my own judgments with regard to my own family, hmm. um, some of those, those appreciations changed. And, and in, that, in that movement, which sometimes is subtle and sometimes large, in some cases it was smaller movement, in some cases it was yes. bigger, 
but those movements, even when it's relatively small, uh, they tended to make me all of a sudden um, more hesitant about my my the more subtle judgments that I had. Hmm. Maybe the anthropologist in you too, uh, there trying to self examine. Uh, I, I wonder because that's uh, the writer and, and the anthropologist and, um, and the historian working at the same time and writing you know, from that perspective. I was struck by the fact that Nuestra America is a one word, Nuestra, but in the plural, right? Our. America. Uh, and then at the end, uh, and you write in the third person most of the time, but uh, you alternate with the first person. And at the end, it becomes so uh, clearly the I, the first person singular. Uh, there's, a, there's a movement in the book towards the I, mm -hmm. first person singular from the we uh, in the title. Mm -hmm. which is uh, the we of the family and the we of historical movements. And uh, uh, although there are many individual, uh, you know, very individual um, subjects there too, and persons who, uh, portraits. It's a book about, done. you know, you, you are offering portraits too. And that's uh, one of the aspects I like about the book, the art of, portraits no? uh, and you offer a lot but then at the end uh, at the end it's also a first person narrative which is uh, very moving and very touching uh, and I go back to the metaphor you know digging and digging and going back to the places you have been digging and and, and digging and transformation uh, in, in that sense is a it's a very rich a book and one can go back to it. And uh, I was reading yesterday again that last part because it's a way of going back to the book. You know, you start with the last chapter uh, and see uh, what, uh, how it turns the book around too. It's, it's interesting, you know, in, in that sense. Uh, what was the reaction of the Spanish to the Spanish original, quote unquote, uh, in places like Mexico? Well, um, I think that um, it's interesting because um, on the one hand, a, as opposed to the US, uh, the Jewish portion of the history is a lot less known there than here. Um, mm -hmm. And Jewish culture in the US is so, uh, uh, in, to some extent, so pervasive, so well known. And in, in spite Mexico, of Mexican writers like Margot Glantz and others, who mm -hmm. still very yeah. little known. Uh, it's 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 known in certain circles, but it's not as known. And I think that, uh, and but I, I have to say also the South American part is not always so well known in Mexico, mm -hmm. uh, uh, contrary to what one might think. Um, uh, stories of Colombia or stories of Peru that are so mm -hmm. present. So that, that's part of it. Um, I think that um, <clears throat> um, to my mind, uh, in Mexico is ripe for, uh, for rethinking its own national obsessions, you know? And, uh -huh. uh, okay. um, and that, that, that might not be well accepted. I and mean, clearly we have right now a hyper-nationalist movement president, I have a very nationalist, mm -hmm. strongly nationalist movement as well. And it's not, and Mexico's always had a very strong reactive toward the US uh, national identity. Um, and, and, and I think is often quite rightly proud of a lot of that, but, um, but at the same time, uh, Mexican integration to the U.S. is so deep right now, and mm -hmm. it, not only to the U.S., but in the first place to the U.S., and then you know elsewhere toward the South as well. Um, that um, to some extent the national narrative is um, um, is something that that is ringing a little bit uh, a little bit hollow and. Mm -hmm. um, a book like this, which is at once intimate and 
um, and socially connected, deeply connected to the social and political process was, uh, was I think, uh, something that really caught the attention of a number of people mm -hmm. there. And not only in Mexico, also in South America, you know. Mm -hmm. in, in, so I think that it does have a, <clears throat> an unsettling um, effect that is at the same time um, productive for, for many people who, who, uh, who are sitting on this problem, but from a different, uh, from a different angle, like for example, the migratory right. angle with the United States, or um, you know, other 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 kinds of uh, transnational border connections. Yeah, that leads me uh, to another question, if I may. Uh, we have time, I think, for maybe one more question um, before we. I, I wanted to to ask you about uh, exit voice and loyalty. Uh, <laughs> the, the question raised by. Um, Albert Hirschman, uh, uh, we both admired him very much, and another great uh, Jewish intellectual who, who came to the US too and lived in Latin America. Uh, and, uh, and he wrote um, a book, but also essays on that topic, uh, Exit Voice and Loyalty, what happens? And he's, he's talking about, about the displacement and exile and diaspora without using those words. What happens when a community leaves one place, goes to another? What happens to those left behind? Uh, is voice stronger for those who left and weaker uh, in those who remain behind? Or, or there's a relationship between voice and loyalty? And I think your book uh, is dealing with those questions of voice and loyalty mm -hmm. too uh, mm -hmm. in exile. Mm -hmm. and what happens to those who were left behind and what happens to those who start a new life mm -hmm. too? What mm -hmm. happens to their voice? And where is their loyalty? Those are big questions. Huh? They are huge questions and I think that uh, very pertinent ones. I, I tend to think a little bit that, uh, that exile, that movement uh, <clears throat> strengthens voice a little bit, uh, mm -hmm. you know, in the sense that uh, that the eccentricity makes uh, makes it possible to uh, to think and say things that sometimes belonging close belonging in, inhibits uh, because yeah. of some of the consequences of those thoughts. Um, um, so there is something that there is some freedom of thought that comes with some of the loss, um, mm -hmm. uh, some of the losses of exile, some of the losses in general. I think. Um, but at the same time that there's that freedom, I think that there is also um, a, there is also the the problem of loyalty, but and also both the loyalty and its opposite, right? Betrayal. Um, mm -hmm. um, a, the the concern with with betrayal, even betraying oneself and betraying um, those left behind, for instance. Um, or those in the cases of, you know, major tragedies like the Holocaust and uh, wars and like that, uh, in, in those that survived versus those that did not, the problem of survival and how that is worked through, represented, and uh, also silenced uh, is, is, is there. And uh, I think that in this case, um, in my case, um, a part of part of the what the condition of possibility of a book like this is not only um, a questions of exile and movement, but also to some degree age. Mm, um, okay. You know, I think that um, that at a certain, I don't think this is a book I could have written twenty years ago or mm. thirty years ago. Um, and um, in, in the sense that um, that if you don't voice something at a certain point, there's something that's irretrievably lost. Hmm. Um, I wrote this book and I didn't, I, this, this book was very irresponsible book at a certain level. I mean, a, you know, it's, it's, it's not a scholarly book in a traditional sense because 
I don't have um, a, you know, I don't have a number of the languages that I would have needed to write this as a, as a historian would write this. Mm. Um, I'm not a Jewish historian. I know, you know, uh, there's a lot of stuff that I, that I have only tenuous uh, 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 a handle on. And at the same time, I thought, but if I don't write it, then no one will write it. Hmm. Um, okay. There is no other, who else could write this? You know, nobody. Uh, so at a certain point, voice becomes, uh, uh, to me, um, like a flight forward. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and loyalty is there too. That's yeah. interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you to both of you. Um, we have time for a couple of audience questions. If um, people can type those into the bottom, uh, the Q and A box at the bottom of your screen. So, if you'd like to, um, if you have a question for our speakers tonight, you can uh, you can type that in, and uh, we'll we'll read that out. We have one, we have one question um, that I think is more of a clarification from early on. Claudio, you um, you were talking about the destruction of Europe and one of our audience members wants to know, were you speaking specifically about the destruction of European Jews or were, was it more of an expansive definition? Um, no, I, I do see this as more expansive. Uh, to me, uh, <clears throat> the destruction of Europe is you know a process that begins in World War One and and kind of ends uh, with the end of World War II. And, uh, and you see um, a tremendous movement toward the Americas in connection to this, um, and a, a tremendous movement in uh, Latin American, for instance, consciousness mm -hmm. in relation to this destruction. Some of it didn't even need people arriving from Europe to happen, like for instance, World War <clears throat> I. Um, a, and the sort of the end of the Belle Epoque and you know, this, this murderous machine kind of warfare of a great war, so-called great war, um, <clears throat> um, disillusioned a lot of people in Latin America with regard to, uh, to Europe as, a, as this point of reference for the kind of culmination of civilization and led, toward a, a, led to a, a, an inward a uh, cultural turn that was extremely productive, um, similar, I think, and deeply connected to things like surrealism, Dadaism, and sometimes you get actually said some of the same actual characters moving from from Europe to to Latin America and helping and, and forming part of the ferment of this. Mm -hmm. um, so um, yes, there are a lot of Jewish characters in these stories, in these stories, but not at all exclusively. A question from Julia, um, who wants to know what the response of your family members has been to the book. <laughs> um, well, um, I, I, I won't. I won't take this opportunity to nag the members of my family who have not yet read it. <laughs> Put it that way. Uh, no. Uh, uh, in, in general, the they they've been quite. Uh, Quite moved and uh, and deeply interested, but I, I do note I do want to note too that, um, for instance, my daughter who is in her thirties, uh, early thirties, uh, has taken a long time to to read it. Whereas my son, for example, read it very quickly, and I think that um, not everyone in the family necessarily wants to, 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 to live with this stuff um, at every point in their life. Um, I think that everyone in the family is really grateful that the book exists. I think that some people needed it and devoured it immediately and others did not. And there are of course points of disagreement uh, and that that's, that's true too. As a as a writer, how did you how did you decide what to you know making those choices, what to leave in, what to 
um, what to include, what to, you know, what to mm -hmm. leave out as, as irrelevant, you know, the, mm -hmm. we're always curious at the, you know, at the writer's museum, as mm -hmm. you know, did you make choices as a writer that you wouldn't necessarily have made as a historian? Oh, absolutely. This is not a book that is written as a historian. I can't shake the fact that I have the training of a historian. Um, and I hope that that, uh, that makes, that, that's an added uh, benefit because sometimes if I get into the story of, for example, of Peru in the 1920s or, or rural Col uh, provincial Colombia in the 1930s and 40s or, you know, uh, Romania, in the 30s and, and uh, in the early 40s. Uh, if I get into those, I, I do get into them with some of, at least some of my impulses as a historian and as an anthropologist, because uh, as Arcadio said, I think that the anthropologist is important because it's more, it's a, it's a, it's a kind of discipline that is intersubjective at its heart. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, it's I think closer to the discipline of a writer than, than a lot of historical writing, um, or at least has some potential in that sense. Uh, some greater, I think, greater literary potential at some, at some level. But in, in, <clears throat> I tended to, uh, <clears throat> to bring in only what I thought was either necessary or um, fascinating kind of, um, sometimes I brought in things that I thought were necessary, that were needed. Like, for instance, the book starts practically with a reflection on language mm -hmm. and on language loss and my own insecurity, linguistic insecurity. Um, the book starts with that, uh, not only with language loss, that is how, how did I lose some of the, fa the languages that I would have needed to, to write this book more fully because I'm missing four languages. Uh, <clears throat> that I would have needed, that would have come in very handy. How did that happen? But not only that, what language do I have as a result of this? Because, and that's how the book starts because I think it's a necessary reflection. I, I wrote this book, uh, I decided to write it in Spanish first because um, uh, I, I thought, well, Spanish is to me like Yiddish was to my, my grandparents. It's mm -hmm. the language of the home to me, um, and, but that doesn't mean that I write it better than English. I, I actually don't. Um, I'm insecure in Spanish and I'm also insecure in English. And I, and that's, and I had to confront that uh, from the start. Similarly, as you move along uh, with the story, there, there are a number of points where I have to actually deal with something because I, it, otherwise you can't understand anything. Um, so that's one set of decisions. And the other is really to do much more with desire um, than with necessity. Um, and that's just going into the things that I, that I think matter. And, you know, it's, uh, it's kind of, um, I won't say exactly whimsical because there often are somewhat obsessions there. It's not, not necessarily a matter of whim, but it's, it, it is, deeply subjective. Mm -hmm. We have time for, for one more question. And we have one from John who said, who writes, you have, you've spent so much time exploring the human condition. Do you have any advice for today's young people? Mm -hmm. Well, this book in some way could be seen as a book of advice, all of it to some degree, but it's not, uh, it, 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 it's advice in the form of it like in the old religious text, in the form of an, of an example, yeah. um, rather than in the form of a set of maxims that might come in handy, because I'm not very good at predicting. And uh, I've never, been, whenever I've, I've had the misfortune of saying, oh, I'm sure this is gonna happen. I'm usually wrong and it's, you know, it's kind of embarrassing. I try to avoid it. Um, so, uh, um, I, but I do think that the book as a whole has a, 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 has, a, a has kind of, is an example. And some of that example takes the form a little bit of 
sort of Bildung kind of thing that is a uh, character, but some of it, I think, um, uh, actually in dialogue with my, my editor, Judith Gurevich pointed out, she said that is, is, is more in connection to desire than sometimes to character. Sometimes it's what, because um, the, the stories that are in here, um, there are terrible, there's a lot of trauma as, as Arcadio said, but there's also a lot of, you know, uh, a, a, a lot of joy and a lot of um, kind of existential thrust. Uh, in, in there. And the joyous part of it is to some extent um, central, I think, to, um, <clears throat> to what one might take, take from, from a story like this. Mm -hmm. And because um, in, I don't think that, uh, let's say, uh, some kind of, a, you know, kind of moral backbone or something like that is enough. Uh, I, I think that we need more, a, a little bit more of a libidinal drive of some kind, you know, mm -hmm. you need some, some kind of a, a, a desire. Mm -hmm. in the middle of a situation like ours today. Ours today is a, there, there's so much that's bleak. Um, and, um, and that's, that's what we need to contend with. And I, I think that yes, character helps with that, but it's not the only thing we, right. I think we need to look for desire. We need to give some space and breathing room for, for discovery, for, for desire for this to really, help us. Well, thank you, both of you, for being here tonight and for talking with us about these about these things. Nuestra America is the book, and I will post the link in to purchase from our bookstore partner in the chat one more time for everyone. And so thank you, all of you, for, for being with us this evening. Claudio, Arcadio, thank you so much for that wonderful conversation. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.